everybody. Happy New Year and welcome to 18 Church. We're so glad you're with us. We stand your feet with us as we worship our God together. Sing it out. Betty at the line looking now. Looking out to all that's ahead. When every heart confesses your name. We're pressing on towards that day. We're never gonna stop. Gonna stop letting go of every mistake, throwing off the chains of restraint. All that will remain a passion for your name, burning as we run this race. We're never gonna stop, we're never gonna stop, we're never gonna stop. Never gonna stop
God, no matter what is going on, no matter what situation we face, the circumstances of our lives, there is nothing that you are not able to handle. There is nothing you are not able to help us get through. We thank you, God, that not only you have that, but you freely give that to us. We love you, God. We thank you, God, and we worship you, Lord, on this first Sunday of this new year. Thank you, God, for your goodness. We love you, God. Amen. Amen. Good morning, A2. We're so glad you're here with us. Especially if it's your first time here, we're just thrilled that you're here with us this morning. You may be seated. this. Good morning, E2 Church. That's a pretty good good morning for the first Sunday of the new year. I know some of you are dealing with the hangover of having eaten lots and lots of food, having had a few days off of work, so it's hard to get back into the groove. So let's try it once more, bring a little more energy to the table as we do it. Good morning, A2 Church. Happy New Year to you. It is so awesome to see you. It is so awesome to see you. Um, if you're a first, second, third, fourth time guest, welcome or welcome back. We are so glad you're here. The only thing we ask our guests to do, and I'd like to ask you to do that even now, is take out one of the connection cards that's in the seat in front of you. Go ahead and complete that. Prepare to drop it into the container that's going to pass in a few moments. For both guests and regulars, if there's anything we can join you in praying about, we take your prayer needs seriously. And a lot of people pray regularly for your needs. So if you'd like to list both guests and regulars, any prayer needs, go ahead and list those now on that connection card. That way you can be at a place of freedom uh, when we move towards response at the end of our time today and not have to bother with that, at least, hopefully not a lot. Uh, you should have received a program when you came in, and it is jammed with lots of information, and evidently I left my program somewhere, probably on the front seat, but I do have this, and I'd like you to take out this brochure that should be inside the program because I don't want you to miss anything. Today, today, January 4th, we begin 14 days to refocus. This is a period of prayer and fasting. We believe giving God the first portion of the year sets, sets us up to receive God's best for the remainder of the year. This little brochure explains a lot about prayer, about fasting. It is not obviously exhaustive when it comes to fasting. Uh, the varied kinds of fast are probably as different as the varying kinds of people in this room. Some of you may choose a complete fast, abstaining from everything but liquids. Others of you may choose a Daniel-type fast, abstaining from meats, breads, sweets, those kinds of things. Others of you with dietary restrictions, you may choose, and this could be fundamentally life-changing for some of you, a media fast. Uh, for others of you, a social media fast may be life-changing. I'd like for you to consider that not for the purpose of just abstinence, but for the purpose of dedicating whatever time you're going to set aside to eat, whatever time you spend, and I think it would shock you the amount of time, those of you who are into social media, I think it would shock you the amount of time you spend on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Instead of spending time there, we set aside this time to be with God, to pursue the heart of God. Now to aid us, and I know it's going to seem so revolutionary to some of you, to aid us in this for the next six days, Monday through Friday, and then Saturday, Monday through Friday, we will be meeting in this room every morning at 6 a.m. And I want to tell you, it is life-changing. Could you shut that door over there? I keep seeing a glimpse of light coming out and it's distracting to me. I apologize for that. That's my ADD taking hold right there. Just every time I looked over, I would see that and it, it would distract me. Um, 
Last year we did this, and I think everyone would say those who attended prayer regularly, as regularly as possible, would say it was life-changing for them. It's very simple. There's not a lot of frills. We begin some mornings with worship. We always begin with a short devotional, and the rest of it's prayer. And then we close, for those who want to, with a circle time right here at the front. You know, I heard this week, somebody said, you know, and they were being very sincere. They said, you know, I quit coming to prayer because of circle time at the end, and I was so nervous somebody was going to ask me to pray, and it just sent me into a panic. I can promise you, I never ask anybody to pray that I'm not certain would love to pray. For instance, I could ask Sherry to pray right now. She'd pray at the drop of a hat. She'll drop the hat to pray. That's how much she loves to pray. But I promise you, we would never embarrass you. And if you don't want to stay for the circle time, if you're afraid of being close to people, hey, hang out in a chair somewhere and pray. But the morning prayer times are fundamentally life-changing. Some have said, I would come, but I can't stay for the whole time. I can't stay until 7. A variety of businessmen and women who have jobs come and they stay as long as they can and they ease quietly out and nobody's taking roster. Nobody says, "Uh uh-oh, somebody's leaving. I just want to encourage you to make this time count. I really... I really sense God upon this. And I just want to pray right at the outset of it. I want to pray that our hearts would be softened to God, that God would lead us. This is not a church that believes in legalism. Some of you may hear this and say, fasting, I don't want anything to do with that. That's cool. That that really is cool. I don't want you to feel pressure because it is not the act of fasting. It is not, oh, I'm giving up food and I hate every minute of it. I want everybody to know about it. That doesn't move the heart of God. If you don't feel compelled, if you don't feel compelled to do this, opt out and just say, God, lead me at my own pace. But I will say this, he's going to lead be willing to follow. Deal? Everybody say deal. Cool. All right, let's pray. 14 days to refocus. Some of you are so desperate for this. For some of you, your spiritual life hinges on this. Father, we don't want to be led by feeling. We do not want to be led by emotion. But in this moment, we want to act decisively with a heart that desires you to pursue you. So lead people in terms of the fast that they would, could choose. Lead people in terms of the time you want them to dedicate to prayer. For those who've not yet established a Bible reading plan for 2015, I pray that today would be the day they make that shift, they make that change, because I know that can be fundamentally life-changing. I pray that those who need assistance in terms of pursuing a fast would get an accountability partner today who would cheer them on. Now we dedicate this morning's service to you. And I pray that you would help me speak, preach, teach your word. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said aloud, amen. Amen. All right, let's dive in. This is the first part of a brand new series called Refocus. Uh, If you want to know how you're doing in several areas of life, there are various tools or instruments that'll give you an accurate assessment or appraisal of that particular area of life. For instance, this is a mirror, and this is what you look at in the morning if you want to know the truth the truth about your face. Every line, every wrinkle, every gray hair, every missing hair, every blemish, it all shows up in a mirror. Now, if you're a guy, when you wake up and look at this, it's a pretty sobering thing. 
I mean, if you're a woman, you have some options that can sort of upgrade, enhance, or improve the appearance of your face. Women are allowed to use certain products to improve their appearance. I'm using that in quotation marks. These products have interesting names like concealer or foundation. Those are pretty scary terms, aren't they? But when you're a guy, looking in a mirror is a terrifying experience because you know when you look in this mirror, this is as good as it's going to get all day long. (laughs) And here's the really bad news. It's going to be even worse next year. Uh, Anybody know what this is? Anybody love this, especially at this time of the year? This is what you step on when you want to know the truth about your weight. Now, sometimes people try to finesse a set of scales. In fact, sometimes you can even tell the gender of a person by the way they get on a set of bathroom scales. People of a particular gender will often take their shoes off before they get on. Sometimes they'll take their clothes off, their jewelry off, their contact lenses out. They'll even exhale before they get on. There are some people who will not even step on a set of these without first blow drying their hair. Christian author and comedian Ken Davis describes an account about a time when he was held underwater to determine the precise fat content of his body. He says it just about killed him. So at the end of the experiment, he wrote the following suggestion. This is Ken Davis. If you insist on knowing the fat content of your body, I've developed a method that will not cost you a cent. Next time you get out of the shower, grab a stopwatch and stand in front of a full-length mirror totally naked. Start the watch and stomp your foot on the floor as hard as you can. When stuff stops moving, punch the watch and check the time. Davis writes, I'm down to two days, three hours, and six minutes. Is that awesome or what? Scale is what you step on if you want to know the truth about your weight. Or how about this? This is the picture of an eye chart. Now, I'm going to do an experiment that will be rather scary. Without these, only because I have looked at this eye chart, only because I can make out the top two arms of the letter E, everything else is an absolute blur. That is what you look at if you want to know the truth about your eyes. Putting on a pair of these brings everything into crystal clarity. At least, I hope it's crystal clarity. I'm not going to try to read P-D-T-N-U-H-Z. Hopefully, I got it. You know, keeping the prescription on a pair of glasses up to date is essential if you want to have clarity about anything for me taking place more than six inches away from my face. Without these, everything, you are a complete blur. You ever thought about this kind of stuff? An accurate assessment of spiritual focus and clarity, on the other hand, is a lot more difficult to come by. They don't make a chart for this kind of stuff. And this series is about refocusing your life on what really absolutely matters. You see, it's so easy to live life in a fog. It's so easy to live life in a haze. It's so easy to get unfocused and waste days, weeks, months. Some people even waste years on stuff that in the grand scheme of things never really matters. In fact, the philosopher Pascal, he wrote this, man's sensitivity to little things and insensitivity to the greatest things are marks of a strange disorder. And he's right. We spend so much time on stuff that doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter now. But it really doesn't matter in light of eternity. 
in so little time on the stuff that is absolutely essential to living the kind of life God intended for us to live. An excellent new book. I recommend it to everybody in this room. It's a little book called Look and Live by musician, worship leader, now author, Matt Papa. He accurately describes our problem when he writes, we live in the most fast-paced, work-obsessed, information obese, non-stop culture that has ever existed. We have cultural ADD, a poverty of attention, a complete societal inability to stabilize ourselves upon one thing. We marry later and mature later. Where former cultures knew a whole lot about a few things, we know very little about everything. It's like the difference between a river and a swamp. One has boundaries. One can go anywhere. One is alive. One is dead. Twitter, Facebook, laptops, iPhones, iClouds, iMe, iNoise, blah, 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 blah. A swamp of distraction, not a river of focus. But we need to take this swampy, attention-deprived sickness one level deeper. Papa continues, what we've just discussed is only an outward cultural manifestation of an inward spiritual reality. What we really have is an ADD of the soul. We cannot focus on God. We cannot see God. Our soul is swampy. This is our real poverty of attention. This is the greatest thing we lost in the fall. Our inability to behold glory, to attend God's glory with the full focus, with with the full force of our focus. Boy, does that hit home with you? I read those words in a hospital room this week, and they just melted me. Book of Hebrews, if you've got your Bibles, you may want to open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going to encourage you this year, you'll notice you've got blank notes, but not fill in the blank notes. And the reason being, I want to get you to bring your Bible to church. And I'm even going to encourage you, if you use an iPhone or a smartphone or some kind of smart device for version or Bible Gateway, go ahead, open that up to Hebrews chapter 12. There's a warning. If you're using your iPhone or smart device for anything other than to look at Scripture, Bad things may happen to you during the course of this message. (laughs) There's a story in Acts chapter 5 where a guy and a gal by the name of Ananias and Sapphira came to church and instead of looking at version or Bible Gateway, they instead did their shopping list and they died in the middle of a church service. (laughs) Check it out, Acts 5. (laughs) Book of Hebrews. That was a joke for some of you who are worried about my Bible literacy at this moment. (laughs) Book of Hebrews was written to a group of people who were starting to lose focus. They were starting to get fuzzy when it comes to what really mattered. They had gotten tired and become weary. They had started really, really strong. They had started with lots of clarity about what really matters, but then they started to do what inevitably occurs unless you pay real close attention. They started to drift, drift away even from the essentials. I want to challenge you to read the book of Hebrews. It's a weighty book to read. It's a heavy book to read. And you will not get it on even multiple readings, but you will get some of it. And you will get warning after warning where the writer warns these guys, hey, hey, time out. You are starting to drift. Time out. Don't lose focus. Time out. What you need to do is persevere. And if you do the backstory on this group of people, you come to understand that after more than 10 years of loss, pain, hurt, seemingly unanswered prayers... This was the reason some were starting to lose hope, lose focus. More frightening than that, 
More frightening than that, and please, please, I'm going to give you a word of pastoral concern for a moment. More frightening than that, some of them were even on the verge of completely abandoning their faith in Christ. They were on the verge of throwing in the towel and reverting back to Judaism. They even have it all rationalized. Hey, I still believe in God, but I don't do the Jesus thing anymore. So the writer of Hebrews, he spends several chapters describing to us and for us the excellency of Jesus Christ. He tells us how much better Jesus is than any other possible alternative. He basically drives it home again and again and again. Guys, he says, Jesus isn't one option among a smorgasbord of spiritual options. Jesus is essential. He's it. If you miss him, you've missed it all. You've missed the grand purpose of the focus for your life. Uh, The whole book is basically the author's challenge. Whatever you do, brothers and sisters, please refocus, 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 refocus. Now, Now, some of you saw the Refocus 2015 graphic, and you thought this would be a series about five areas of life where you need to gain focus and clarity. We we may do some of that later in the series, but today I want to talk about the one thing. The one thing. The one thing that is absolutely essential. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us, notice these two challenges, strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that easily trips us up. Don't miss that. He gives you two challenges right there. If you're taking notes, you might want to jot them down. Challenge number one, strip off every weight. In most sporting events where speed counts weighing in as a part of the daily routine, it's one of the most reliable indicators of performance. The word weight in Hebrews 12.1 means mass or bulk of something. It's not necessarily, this is interesting, it's not necessarily bad, it's not necessarily sinful. It might even seem innocent or harmless. The problem isn't what the weight is, the problem is what the weight does, and the weight slows you down. The weight weighs you down. The weight diverts your attention, saps your energy, dampens your enthusiasm for God, for Jesus Christ. It keeps you focused on stuff that doesn't matter instead of focusing on the one thing that is absolutely essential. For some of you, weight is some relationship. For some of you, weight is a habit. For some of you, weight is a sin that keeps keeps you stuck in this moment. For some of you, it's a guilty pleasure. It's a certain form of entertainment. It's a preoccupation with sports. It's a preoccupation with the stock market. Weight is anything that blocks, stymies, or slows down your spiritual progress. That's why 14 days to refocus is essential. The process of fasting will help you identify weight in your life. Let me just say, if you can't fast Netflix for 14 days, that might be an indication that you've got a problem. I'm not saying you should. I'm saying if you can't. If you can't fast Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram for 14 days, that's an indicator. That might be weight. Again, I'm not saying you should. I'm saying it might be a problem. If you can't give up chocolate milk for 14 days, or let's hit home, how about a cup of high-test caffeinated coffee? 
it might be an indication. I'm not saying you should give it up. I'm saying if you can't give it up. You see, Paul says, I can enjoy all things, but I'll not be mastered by anything. Now, some of us like to talk about our liberty to drink alcoholic beverages, and you attend a church where I regularly preach about the, pa- about the fact that there's no prohibition against drinking a glass of wine. No prohibition in the Bible about having a beer at the end of a day. But if you can't give up a glass of wine or a beer for 14 days, that might be an indication that you, sir, you, ma'am, have a problem. In the church I grew up in right now, somebody would be saying, preach. (laughs) Strip off every weight. See, we're not talking about sin. We're talking about good things that can become controlling things. Strip off every weight. And then he gives us another challenge. And this is a very specific challenge. Strip off the sin that so easily trips us up. It's really interesting that the author uses the definite article, the sin, that easily trips us up. What is the sin? I mean, since he uses the definite article, the sin, he must be talking about a particular sin. What is the particular sin? And let me just say, it's none of the biggies some of you are instantly going to. Do you know what the sin is? The sin that the author of Hebrews, Hebrews zeroes in on, focuses on, is the same sin that has dogged humanity since the garden. And it's the sin of doubt. It's the sin of, it's the sin of unbelief. It's our regular inability to just trust God. I mean, look at the chapter that immediately precedes Hebrews chapter 12. What is it all about? It is about by faith and then a series of different heroes who accomplished great things for God through faith. And now he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he's been saying this all throughout the book. Get rid of the sin. In other words, start trusting God. Now let's read the the whole passage and then we're going to bring it down to practical time and respond with worship. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. What is the essential thing? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Would you just say those words out loud and together with me? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Let's say those words again out loud even louder, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. Now, he gives us two motivations in those three verses for the race we run. Here are the motivations if you want to jot them down. He says, first of all, look back. You could even say it, look around at the crowd of witnesses. Who is this mysterious crowd of witnesses? Therefore, seeing we are encompassed with such a great crowd of witnesses to this life of faith, who is this great crowd of witnesses? It's the group of people he just described to us in Hebrews chapter 11. It's Abel, who worshiped by faith. Enoch, who walked with God by faith. Noah, who worked for God by faith. Abraham and Sarah, who believed God by faith. Moses, who obeyed by faith. The list goes on. Barak, Gideon, Samson, David, Samuel. He lists one spiritual champion after another who did great things for God. Utterly ordinary men and women who got a lot of stuff wrong. If you read their stories, they got a lot of stuff wrong, but they got one thing right, They trusted God. Now, here's the picture. Here's the picture the writer of Hebrews wants us to get. And I want you to get this. Man, I am not an athlete, but this pumps me up. Here's the picture he wants you to get. He wants you to imagine yourself on the racetrack. 
You're on the game field, and what you're doing is pumping up. You're, you're airing out. You're getting ready for game time. You're doing all of those calisthenics. You're doing all of the stretches. You're getting ready. And, and, and you know game clock is about to begin. You know the whistle is about to blow. But before, before you take your mark, you glance up into the grandstands. And he says, I want you to see who's up there, guys. I want you to see who's up there, girls. If you look closely, you'll see Abel, Noah, Abraham, Enoch, Sarah, Gideon, Esther, Moses. The list goes on. Peter, James, John. How about Paul? They're there. Go through church history. You'll see guys like Jim Elliott, Jonathan Edwards, Amy Carmichael, Mary Slessor, Mother Teresa, Dwight Moody. They're there. You squint a little harder. You see a grandfather or a grandmother, an aunt, an uncle, a mom, a dad, people who've had a profound influence on your life, impacted you personally with the gospel. They're all there in the stands. And what are they saying? They're cheering you on. Here's what he wants you to see. He's wanting you to see those great saints of old saying, hey, Kevin, stay in the race. Don't give up. Keep believing God. You're almost there. You see, these guys aren't nice people who attend a game of golf and clap politely. They're in it. They're in it. They're in it. They're cheering you. If you look up, you'll see a guy named Abel. And Abel is saying, hey, nothing but the blood. Cling to the finished work of the cross. The cross is what really counts. If you look at Noah, Noah will say, trust and obey. Trust and obey. Just take the hammer that's in your hand and keep doing what God has commanded you to do. Moses would be saying, hey, Jack, they might have you hemmed in, but our God is the God who makes a way where there is no way. You look closer, you might see Abraham and Sarah. They'll say, hey, dude, we were on the way to Walmart to get a box of the pins, but God interrupted our life. He gave us a baby boy at old age. Now we're going after pampers and baby food. Believe God, believe God. You'll see Gideon, Gideon will say, you might feel outnumbered, but with God, one plus God is the majority, just believe. That's the crowd of witnesses. Now for those of you uncomfortable because I'm shouting, we're talking sports. I don't imagine any of you were calm watching the game. A few nights ago, whichever game it was, I would like to report to you, in spite of a lot of bad news, the Tennessee Vols actually won on Friday. <laughs> look back, look around at the crowd of witnesses. You know what they're all saying? Trust God. Trust God. Trust God. Trust God, trust God, trust God, trust him. Don't give up. And then he says this, second motivation, look up. Look up to Jesus. See, it would be really easy. In fact, I have to admit to you, I've preached this text a few times before. And in the past, when I preached this text, I made the text all about perseverance and endurance what I have to do. And it could be really easy to read this text, hear this challenge, run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, and come to the conclusion that it's all about my grit, my determination, my willpower, my self-discipline. It all depends on me. It would be easy to do that, but wrong. Because of verse 2. Let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Remember, we said this a few times. We'll say it again. Would you say it again? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes. God's word says fix because that's what you have to do. The first thing when you get up in the morning, you have to fix. You have to glue. You have to fight to focus your attention on Jesus. 
fixing our eyes on Jesus. Don't glance at Jesus. You glance at a light bulb in your home. You fix your eyes on a sunset. You glance, take a casual look at a website. You fix your eyes on a Rembrandt. You eat, if you can actually call it that, you eat a McDonald's hamburger. You savor a bacon wrap with shrimp on top, filet mignon, cooked medium where the center is pink. Mm. (laughs) Challenges. Fix our eyes on Jesus. And it isn't going to be easy in a culture like this fixed with, filled with distraction. And then he says, consider him in verse 3. And the word consider is a fascinating Greek term. It's a word that's used to describe a jeweler who examines a diamond to discover its excellence and value. He studies it. This lit me up when I was reading Matt Papa's book this week, he wrote, and I'll quote, it comes up on the screen, worship is war. See, it's hard to fix your eyes on Jesus. Worship is war. The call is to behold the Son of God, not merely look at him. It is to gaze deep into the gospel, not merely pray some prayer and then move on. We must linger. Christianity is the hard, joyful journey of beholding Jesus by faith, of looking at Jesus, gazing at Jesus, fixing your eyes on Jesus by faith until one day you behold him by sight. And get this, in your life, Jesus is the only thing worthy of that kind of look. That steady gaze. So, Janet comes, and I'm going to give you, as she does, in uh, about seven minutes, four things that will help you keep your eyes focused. You ready? And these are really, really crucial. So I I want you to jot them down, and here's what I'll do. I'll put extended notes, and I've been doing this recently, extended notes on the website along with... Uh, the message mp3 or download. How do you keep your focus fixed in a world filled with distractions? Four, Four simple things. Number one, get into God's word. Get into God's word. Get into God's word. Hey, get into God's word. You need to know this about the Bible. The Bible is God's special revelation to us of Jesus Christ. It's where we discover who Jesus is, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he is about. And we are some of the most privileged people on the planet. Don't turn it down too low back there, guys. They're still taking notes. And we've got three more to go. We're some of the most privileged people on the planet We all can have an individual, our own copy of this. Our own copy. And I want you to imagine what you have when you get a copy. The Bible is not a book technically, it's 66 books, 39 books in what we call the Old Testament, 27 in what we call the New Testament. It was written over a span of more than 1,600 years by more than 40 authors from all kinds of walks of life, kings, peasants, philosophers, fish, fishermen, poets, scholars. It was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek. But authors spread out on three different continents, Asia, Africa, Europe. Yet the Bible contains remarkable continuity, clarity, and focus on one. It develops and sustains one storyline from the first chapter of Genesis to the last chapter of Revelation, chapter 22. And it's all about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Read this book, study this book, get this. Here's a new word for you. Meditate on this book. Meditate on this book. 
Now, there are all kinds of exhortations in the Bible about meditating on the Word of God. And the term that almost always gets used to describe meditating on the Word of God is the term that's used to describe, for those of you who grew up on a farm, a cow chewing the cud. Anybody familiar with this? It's a very vivid analogy. Sort of gross, unless you're a 10 year old boy, then it's really exciting. Do you realize this? A cow spends nearly eight hours a day chewing the cud. Eight hours a day. And here's the way it works cows' stomachs actually have four compartments. So when a cow eats, chews its food just enough to moisten it, then it swallows it, sends it down to the first compartment in the stomach. Food gets mixed up with some acidic digestive juices, gets softened a little more, and then the cow thinks to itself, hmm, I'd like to chew on that a little more. Mm. And it comes right back up into the mouth. And the cow chews just a little longer. And then the cow decides, I'm going to send it down to the second compartment in my stomach. Sends it down to the second compartment. Get this. I love this analogy. This is vivid. This is the actual Hebrew way, word. The second compartment in the stomach actually squeezes the food to get out every ounce of nutrient. Squeezes the food. Then the cow thinks, hmm, maybe there's something left. Okay. Chews a little more, then sends it down until finally it goes through all four compartments and every nutrient possible is derived from that food. Psalm 119 says, I've stored up your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. It goes on, how can a young man keep his way pure? By attending to the perfect law of God. You want transformational change in your life? Read this book, study this book, meditate on this book. Here's something else, memorize this book. God will begin changing you from the inside out, but I don't understand all of it. That's okay. In fact, if you're a brand new Christian, I want to suggest a starting place. I want to suggest you start with the book of Matthew. Read Matthew, read about all that Jesus did. After you finish, Matthew, I've got another suggestion. Read it again. The book of Matthew? Yeah, just read Matthew again. After you read Matthew a second time, if you feel like you've got sort of an understanding on it, then you can go on to Mark. Just read the book of Mark. Read it two or three times. It's only 16 chapters. After you read that two or three times, read the book of Luke. What, 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 what about everything else? You're going to get to it. Right now, you're just focusing on Jesus. Because Hebrews 12, 2 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. You see, you don't have to understand everything. But what if you understood one grand and glorious thing? What if you understood the greatest thing? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's number one. Get into God's Word. Number two, talk to God about anything and everything. That's the essence of prayer. It's talking to God about God, talking to God about your pain, His promises, talking to God about your problems, His provisions, talking to God about your issues, His character. Talk to God. And let me just say, don't make this difficult. Some people blow it at the beginning of a new year by saying, I'm going to spend one hour every day in prayer. Now that's quite sizable. And if you do that, more power to you. That is awesome. I salute you. And I'm not saying that cavalierly. I say it with depth and meaning. I salute you. But some of you don't need to have that grand of a goal or idea. You need to start with five minutes. You need to start first thing when I get out of the bed in the morning. I'm just going to kneel beside my bed and say, okay, God. You're bigger than me. You've got this day. You know what's going to go down before I ever get there. Help me to honor you. Help me to, to do the right thing and the wise thing, not the easy thing or the convenient thing. God, 
Would you let the fruit of your spirit operate in me and through me? Help me to love people and to love you more. Help me to live with joy, to choose it regardless. God, would you help me watch the words that come out of my mouth? Help me speak words that build others up, that that do not tear them down. Maybe you're married. You could pray, God, help me to love my spouse like Jesus loves the church. I just surrender all of this to you. If you need help, you say, Chris, I can't think of any of that. Then look up a great prayer. Google Scotty Smith, Everyday Prayers. He's written a book filled with prayers. And there are some mornings when I can't find the words for the prayer I want to pray. And I just take one of Scotty's prayers and I just walk around and I pray it out, out loud to God. And when something comes to me, I just lean into that and begin praying it. Three, connect with people who encourage you to live lights out for God. You need some people who help you keep focused on Jesus. And here's the fourth, live like you really believe God. Live like you really believe God. In other words, put your faith into action. Now, I took nine minutes instead of seven, but let's respond right now. I want to invite you to stand. Look at me. Some of us have lost focus. Ushers, would you prepare? We have thoroughly lost focus about what really matters. So I'm going to give an invitation for you to return to God this morning. For you to ask God to restore your focus. And then our response is going to be, returning the connection cards that we've already completed. If you call this place home, honoring God with his tithe and our offering and the lifting of our voices to God in a hymn of praise. So let me lead you in a prayer. If you need to return to God, if you need God to restore your focus, if your eyes have been fixed on everything else but Jesus. comfortable in doing it just hold your hands out with palms facing upward say these words out loud Heavenly Father I admit I've been distracted diverted from what matters most the one who matters most Forgive me for my inattention. Forgive me for my lack of focus. And help me this morning fix my eyes on Jesus who began my faith and promises to complete my faith. Help me to refocus. I'm depending on you. If you've got one of those connection cards and you just made a return to Jesus, you can reach down, take it out, jot that down real quick. If you call this place home, go ahead and prepare to honor God with his tithe and our offering. It's a part of worship. It's not an interruption. For some of you, it could be the most meaningful thing you've done all morning long. In fact, very real way, it's often a way where we refocus. For my wife and I, it's where we remind ourselves it really does all go back to Him. I'm going to give you a moment to do that. Janet's going to lead us in worship. The containers are going to pass. Be attentive to the containers, but then after they pass, there's nothing, nothing on the agenda this morning but fixing our eyes on Jesus. After we sing this song just as thoroughly as it can be done, I'm asking Janet and the team to take every liberty. If we need to add a verse, add a chorus, just lean into whatever we need to do.
after we sing this song as thorough as we can, prayer teams, I'm going to ask you to gather here because there are going to be a lot of people who just want that prayer time where they say, hey, I was out of focus, but this morning, God has helped me to get back on track. So prayer teams, come immediately. Musicians will keep playing quietly, but let's worship and let's sing. Ushers, please come.
prayer teams just come forward. Benediction. May your eyes, may your eyes be filled, filled with, fixed on the glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ. And as the glory of Jesus fills your eyes, may his love and grace fill your heart until you know what can't be known, the depth, the height, the breadth, the width of God's extravagant love. Until that love gives you confidence, security, strength for not only today, but for this evening. May you live with your eyes fixed on Jesus. Amen. I'd like prayer. These teams are here to serve you about anything going on in your life. I'd like for Zach to come. I'd like for one of the prayer teams to pray for him as he moves to California. We're praying God's blessing on you, Zach. That you just be fixed on Jesus as you travel a couple thousand miles away. If you'll come on. God bless you. Go with God. He's going with you.